explain osmo regulation. Now this is right at the end of module six for AQA A-level biology, but it's also needed for those of you that are studying OCR biology, and we're gonna go into sufficient detail for both of those examples. So osmo regulation, let's start with the brain. Uh, I feel like this is gonna be a lot of writing. Uh, if the water potential of the blood is too low, so the blood is too concentrated, the water potential of the blood is too low. What is going to detect that decrease in water potential? Well, it's going to be detected by osmoreceptors. And osmoreceptors, we should know, are found in the hypothalamus in the brain. So osmoreceptors monitor the water potential of your blood. And in this scenario, we're going to talk about what if they detect that the water potential of the blood is too low. These osmoreceptors, by the way, they're receptors, but they're actually sensory neurons. So when they detect the water potential of the blood as being too low, what they do is the osmoreceptors send electrical impulses or action potentials to the posterior pituitary gland. And yes, you do need to say posterior pituitary gland. Then the posterior pituitary gland releases ADH, which is an abbreviation that you're allowed, allowed to use. It stands for antidiuretic hormone. So the antidiuretic hormone itself is released from the posterior pituitary gland, but what stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release that ADH is the electrical impulse that it receives from the osmoreceptors themselves, which are in the hypothalamus. Okay, so the hypothalamus is right next to the pituitary gland. The osmoreceptors detect that fall in water potential and send electrical impulses to the posterior pituitary gland, making it release ADH. So we're now going to have more of this hormone, antidiuretic hormone, traveling in the bloodstream, which I'm just going to make a note of because we should know how hormones are transported. So ADH travels in the bloodstream to its target organ, which is the kidneys, because obviously it's our kidneys that make urine and can ultimately regulate how much water gets reabsorbed back into the blood and how much water we will lose in our urine. So ADH travels to the bloodstream, uh, it goes to the kidneys and it acts on cells of the two parts of the nephron that ADH receptors are found on. So it acts on the cells of the collecting duct, which is the final part of the nephron, and the distal convoluted tubule, which is the part of the nephron just before the collecting duct. So just a little note here, receptors for ADH are found on these two parts of the nephron. So they're found on the cells that line the connecting duct and the cells that line the distal convoluted tubule. That's the two places you find those receptors. I'm just stressing that because they have asked before, where do you find ADH receptors? And you couldn't just say the nephron or the kidney tubule you had to say the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. So now we're gonna look at this diagram to see what effect that ADH will actually have on the reabsorption of water. So here, just to explain the diagram, this is inside of the collecting duct or inside the distal convoluted tubule. So that's the lumen. These are the epithelial cells that line the collecting duct or the distal convoluted tubule. And this is the blood. So this is a capillary. And obviously, ADH that's been secreted by the posterior pituitary gland, it's a hormone, it's traveling in the blood. ADH, I use a different color actually for ADH. So ADH is traveling in the blood. It reaches the kidney, it reaches the DCT and the collecting duct where you find the ADH receptors. ADH will bind, so it will leave the blood and it will bind to its receptors. Now, when ADH binds to its receptors, 
that's going to cause like what we say a cascade of enzyme controlled reactions, which is kind of AQA's way of saying you don't need to know exactly what happens. But ADH binds to those receptors and it's going to cause these vesicles that have aquaporins in them to move towards and fuse with the cell membrane here. Okay, and you can see there, I've just tried to show you, I'll do another one here. So we've got a vesicle moving towards and fusing with the cell membrane, and it's inserting those aquaporins into the cell membrane. Let's write this down. So ADH binds to receptors. And remember, these are receptors that are on the cells that line the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. This causes vesicles containing aquaporins to move towards and fuse with the cell surface membrane. So what's ultimately going to happen is the aquaporins are inserted into the membrane. And this is going to increase the permeability to water. So really what we're doing here is we are increasing the permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct to water. So because we've now inserted these aquaporins into the cell surface membrane, I'll use a blue, more water can move by osmosis into those epithelial cells. So this is my movement of water. And then more water can be reabsorbed back into the blood. So by increasing the permeability to water of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, we've got more water being reabsorbed into the blood. Just go back to black because the blue is not great, is it? Um, so we've got more water being reabsorbed. It's going back into the blood. And that's going to help us to increase our water potential. Because remember, we started this whole story by saying the water potential of the blood was too low. So we want more water to be reabsorbed back into the blood to increase that water potential back to its normal or set point. And we've done that using the hormone ADH which you have to be able to name, or at least not name fully, but ADH is fine. We know that's released from the posterior pituitary gland. We know where its receptors are on the cells that line the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. We know that when it binds, it increases the permeability of these cells to water by inserting aquaporins into the cell surface membrane. And that means more water will be reabsorbed back into the blood. The only other thing we really need to talk about is what's the effect on the urine, which is kind of common sense, right? If you're reabsorbing more water back into your blood, that means your urine will contain less water. You're going to lose less water. So you'd be able to say things like um, urine more concentrated. It would have a higher concentration of urea because you've got less water in the urine, um, and it would also have a lower volume. So you'd be urinating less frequently, you'd produce a lower, a lower volume of urine, and your urine would look darker because it's more concentrated or less dilute. So make sure you can get all the way through to how it actually affects the urine. And that's it, really. Um, obviously, if the water potential of the blood was too high, we'd be saying the opposite. Okay, the posterior pituitary gland does not secrete ADH. So you don't have the ADH increasing the permeability of these cells. So you don't get excess water being reabsorbed into the blood. So the urine would be a larger volume and it would be more dilute. 
Hope you found that video useful, guys. Do let me know in the comments how you found it and if there's any other topics you want me to explain.